going to be on hard bondage, hard bondage. Um, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer first before we get into the message. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would uh, bless this message. I pray that you'd use me as a mouthpiece. Help me, Lord, to bring forth thy word. Uh, help it to come through me as a conduit, Lord, very clear and precise and to the point. I pray that you bless the Sunday school teachers and the Sunday school kids today as, as they also have their lesson. And I pray that um, you just let the congregation get a blessing out of today. If there's, uh, Lord, anybody in the congregation or listening, Lord, that might not know you today as their Savior, they could make peace with you. And today could be the day that they have eternal life. It's free, it's simple, and it's easy. Thank you, God, for making it that way. And I pray that the Holy Spirit would have free course, that the blood of Jesus Christ would cover us and bind the devil today, Lord. Keep him from our midst. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, the kids can be dismissed for Sunday school. I'd like you to turn in your Bible to Exodus chapter 1. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1, and again, today's message is on the subject of hard bondage, hard bondage, often referred to in the Bible as cruel bondage, and I'm going to go to the children of Israel when they were in Egypt. The Bible talks about Egypt being likened to an iron furnace, an iron furnace, uh, and when we go through this, I want you to understand that God had a plan for the nation of Israel. Uh, if you read the book of Genesis, you understand the development of the nation of Israel with Abraham being the first Hebrew, and then the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the 12 patriarchs. And of course, the whole idea of Joseph being sold down into slavery was all by the hand of God. And I want to tell you today, if you've had affliction, infirmity, if you've had distress in your life, oftentimes we look at God and we think he only gives the good things when we consider good things. But oftentimes, affliction, infirmity, distress, sometimes discouragement, sometimes even depression, anxiety, sometimes things in our life that come that we don't think are good for us. In the end, God takes those things and uses those for his own glory and honor. And that's the way God works throughout the whole Bible. A lot of people think coming to Christ is just going to make their life just all of a sudden rosy, and they're going to have no problems. And this is where a lot of people, when they come to Jesus, they come to him, and they accept him as their Savior, and they think that now I'm going to walk this life, and everything's going to be golden. And the first time if something comes at them, affliction or some type of distress in their life comes, they get turned away, and they fall away from God because it's not what they expected. God never promised that to us. In fact, he said, if we, if we live righteously, that we would suffer persecution and that we would go through heartaches and trials would come in our life. And, you know, when Joseph went down into Egypt, he never understood at the beginning why he was going down there. When he got sold into slavery and even when the affair with uh, the thing with Potiphar's wife, when his wife, uh, Potiphar had gone on a journey and his wife was there with Joseph in the house and she sought Joseph and kept saying, lie, lie, uh, lie with me, lie with me, lie with me. And he would not. And after a while, she grabbed a hold of his garment and he left and fled. And she laid up the garment until Potiphar came home. And when he came home, you know, she put on the old sob story and it caused Joseph to be cast into prison. And again, he didn't know why all that was happening to him. But God had a reason. And in the end, in the end, when you read the end of the book of Genesis, you understand that Joseph completely got it. And when it came full circle, he said, I know that all these things befell me for your sake. And that God had done this so he could deliver you. And when God realized, when you realize in your life, when you go through these things and all of a sudden God opens up and shows you and you understand, you turn around and you say, wow what I went through in my life, but it was all for God's glory and honor. And the person that I've become through all that is a much better person now than I was before. And through affliction and through infirmity and through trials, you become a better person for the Lord. You know, and that's the way 
Tribulation, the Bible says, worketh patience, and patience, experience, and experience, hope. See, they're building blocks. Now, we look at Joseph, and he went down into Egypt, and when he was there, he called upon his father Jacob, and he came down. And when Jacob came down with 70 of the family members, they all went into Egypt, and they stayed there. Now they begin to multiply. And as they begin to multiply, the Bible says that there arose another Pharaoh, another king over Egypt that knew not Joseph. And he looked and he began to see all these Israelites, all these Jews. And he said they become abundant. And he had to do something with them. And this is the plan of God. God put them there. God was going to make a great nation. They were there for over 400 years. And as they were there, they kept growing and growing and multiplying and multiplying. And Pharaoh put the pressure on them to the point that it was like being in an iron furnace. This is the, the amount they suffered there. But God was behind the scenes, and he was watching this. And I want you to understand this. The Israelites were separated from the Egyptians. You had the people of God, Israel, and you had the Egyptians. And as we sit here today, we are Christians. And in the eyes of God, we are separate from the world. Okay? God, God makes it very clear that there are the children of God, and there are the children of this world. There are saved people, and there are lost. And in the world today, there is a definite distinction between a Christian, a person who is saved, and between a lost person, a person who doesn't know the Lord as their Savior, a clear delineation. And as God made a clear delineation between Israel and between Egypt, and you, if you study the plagues and the way they fell upon Egypt, they fell upon them both until it came to certain plagues and God separated Israel from the Egyptians, okay? The people of God. God always had an eye on them, even though they were suffering and even though they were going through things. And I want you to get this. Pharaoh, the king, is a perfect type of Satan, okay? He was in control of the Israelites, just as the devil is in control of people. Satan, he's called the God of this world. He controls this world. Remember when he tempted Christ, he said to Jesus, he said, all these kingdoms, the kingdoms of the world, all these kingdoms will I give thee, for mine they are and I deliver them to whom, whomsoever I will, I give them. He said, all shall be thine. The devil said to Christ, all shall be thine, if one thing, thou wilt fall down and worship me, and I'll give you it all. The God of this world controls this world. He controls the minds of the people in this world. An unsaved person is controlled. The Bible says they are taken captive. It specifically says this. They are taken captive by him at his will. An unsaved person is like a puppet on a string. They're natural. They're not spiritual. And the Bible says they don't care for the things of the Spirit, the Spirit of God. That's why the unsaved world looks at church, looks at the Bible, looks at Christians, and they don't understand when you get saved, you get the understanding. The Holy Spirit comes into you. You are no longer natural. You are now spiritual. You begin to seek after the things of God, things that you never sought before. You know why? Because when you get saved, you go from being a child of this world. You go from being controlled by the God of this world to coming into the camp of Christ. And he delivers you from that hard bondage. Now, I want to pick this up, and I want to look in Exodus. And I want you to understand, that's why I laid the groundwork here for this and gave you this whole summary. It's because Pharaoh is a type of Satan, and Egypt is a type of the world. When we got saved, we had our Red Sea crossing. Okay? They were a different people. When they were on this side of the Red Sea, they were still in bondage to Egypt for the most part. And Pharaoh was breathing down their neck to destroy them. He was going to kill every one of them. Satan, the world, how were they going to escape this? The Lord has a way, doesn't he? The Lord has a way. 
he said to Moses, he said, go forward. Which way was forward? They were, they were enclosed. They were encamped in the wilderness. Satan, Pharaoh, had them right where he wanted. His armies were marching down against them. They were encamped here. They were enclosed by water on the backside. Well, this would be the front side because they were walking this way. And he said to Moses, God said to Moses, go forward. Moses thought to himself, how am I going to go forward when it's nothing but water? God has a way. God said, the staff in your hand. There it is, the staff. God's way. You see, Satan and the world want to keep you in bondage. God wants to deliver you. And God wants to give you a new life on the other side of the Red Sea. And today, if you're saved, you've crossed. I praise God, I crossed. I praise God, September 21st, 1976, I crossed. That was my Red Sea crossing. And you know what? I'm now on the other side of the sea. But isn't it true that oftentimes we look back to the world? Isn't it often in our heart that we say, oh, sometimes it's so hard being a Christian and our flesh gets the best of us, and sometimes we long for the pleasures that we had before. And the Bible says that when you do that, it's like a dog returning to their own vomit and a sow, a pig, to her wallowing in the mire. The Lord doesn't want us to look backward. He wants us to look forward. Put your hand to the plow. Work for God and don't look backward. The Lord says straight on. Look straight. Because when you're running that plow and you're looking other ways, you know how it is when you drive. When you drive a car, where should you look? Doesn't the car go where your eyes go? A lot of accidents happen because people weren't paying attention. The Lord says, look straight on. You know, when you get your license, look straight on, follow the road, keep your eyes on the road. Don't look over here. Don't look over there because it goes where you look. Look to God, looking unto Jesus, Jesus, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is set down on the right hand of God, angels and principalities being made subject unto him. Look to Jesus. He'll get you through. He'll get you through. Hard bondage and all of that, the Bible talks of it, but thank God when we got saved, the Lord delivered us from all of that. Okay, uh, Pharaoh type of Satan. Let's go to Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1, it says in verse number 7, we'll cover a little bit of scripture here. It says, and the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceedingly, exceeding mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, with which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them lest they multiply to come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us and so get them up out of the land. Therefore, did, uh, therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasured cities, Python and Ramesses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians... The children of Israel made the children of Israel to serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. And isn't it true, the world and Satan, you know, the things that are in this world and what the devil does to people, the devil is a hard, hard taskmaster. You know, the Lord said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Isn't it true the devil tempts people to do things, and when they do it, they commit uh, sin, and, and they do things, and it gets them, you know, so many people are in distress, and so many people have problems and guilt in their life because of sins that they've committed and things that they've done. But where is the devil to pick them up? He tempts them. 
And oftentimes he'll do that to us too. He'll tempt us to do something and we do it and we feel guilty and we feel the shame of that sin. Where is the devil to pick us up? He's not there. The devil doesn't pick you up. The devil will leave you. He tempts, he leaves. He's not there. He doesn't care for his own. He doesn't care about his own. The Bible talks about him as being a shepherd. He's a hireling. We have a great shepherd, one that cares about us. And when we're down and when we're out, the Lord comes to us and he's there to lift us up. Not hard bondage, not rigor, not cruel affliction. The devil doesn't have that. He doesn't have that towards his, towards his own. Christ does. And Christ offers that to us. And thank God how many of us have felt the, felt the mercy of God in our life. Amen. And that the, the faithfulness of God to be there to pick us up. Oftentimes when we fall, we get in our face and we confess our sin. And the Lord says, okay, get up, get up. And he dusts us off. And, you know, sometimes the Lord chastens us for the things that, he does, that we do. But he's there. He's there to guide us and lead us and keep us. The devil doesn't do that. And in the end, he made them serve with rigor and hard bondage. And not just that, but he took their children from them. Pharaoh was going to kill their children, the male babies. And let's watch here. Let's look at verse number 15. It says, And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one was Shifra, and the name of the other Pua. And he said, When you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stools. If it be a son, then ye shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. Weren't they taking their own lives into their hands? You talk about hard bondage. You talk about cruelty. When you see it's a boy, when you see it's a male child, I want you to kill that child. And the midwives, because they feared God, they said, we're not going to kill that child. We're not listening to the king. And doesn't the Bible say that we ought to obey God rather than men? Hey, I'm all about obeying the, obeying the law. And what the law says we should do. And I agree 100%. But if the law becomes that I can't have this, if the law becomes that I can't pray, as in the case of Daniel, when uh, it was signed by the king that no man should ask any petition but of thee for 30 days, but of thee, king, no man. And when Daniel knew that the petition was signed, what did he do? What did he do? He went out and he prayed, didn't he? The same way he did before. He prayed three times a day towards Jerusalem. He prayed just as he did before. When he knew the writing was signed, his death warrant was signed. The Bible says we ought to obey God rather than men. Hey, again, as Americans, we follow the, the law and what the law says we should do. And amen for that. Amen, we have a constitution and amen, we have rules and laws that we're supposed to follow. But when it comes down that they say you can no longer worship the God that you worship and you can no longer serve the God in the way you serve him, you can no longer have church, you can no longer have the Bible, you can no longer have prayer, you can no longer talk about God, what does God say? God's laws above man's laws. We ought to obey God rather than men and let it fall where it may. And the example of the Hebrew midwives, here was a baby boy. The law was you're supposed to take that boy and you're supposed to kill him. Did they listen? And what happened? Let's read. It says in verse 18, and the king of Egypt called the midwives and said unto them, Why have ye done this thing and have saved the men child, children alive? Now, why, I get a little bit of humor out of this one. Watch what they say. And the midwives said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered ere the midwives come in unto them. They said, It's not our problem, king. It's the difference in the women. The Hebrew women are lively. Basically what they're saying is they're hard workers. They work. And they work and they're strong. And before we're even called, we come in and the baby's born. Now, of course, a little bit of an excuse there, right? Okay, now, what happens next? 
It says in verse 20, therefore God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. And it came to pass because the midwives feared God that he made them houses. And Pharaoh charged all his people saying, every son that is born, he shall cast into the river and every daughter he shall save alive. Again, hard, cruel bondage, servitude and death. This is what the devil offers people. This is what he offers in the end, death. You think about the temptations and the things the devil offers people. He offers them habits. He offers them sinful pleasures. And with all of that comes disease. With all of that comes decay. With all of that comes a life that can turn real bad and real empty. And in the end, bondage. Bondage. The bondage of sin. The world. The Egyptians and Pharaoh had the children of Israel where they wanted them. But God said, I have found a deliverer. He's going to take you out of this place. And that deliverer was Moses. And we know that Moses had to be hid. Moses was a baby boy born. And wasn't he supposed to die? But his mother, again, hid him for three months because she saw that he was a proper child. And she didn't fear Pharaoh's commandment. For three months. How do you hide a baby for three months? They're searching for male baby. How do you hide that baby? You try to hide a screaming child and see what happens. Hid for three months. And when she saw that she could no longer hide him, what did she do? She made the little ark of bulrushes and they put it in the amongst the reeds there along the river. And when Pharaoh's daughter came down, she saw the baby there and the baby began to probably cry. She said, go call a nurse. And his sister, Miriam, was there. And Miriam went and called, get this, Miriam went and called his mother, who now come down. And Pharaoh's daughter said, nurse this child for me and take care of him, and I'll pay you your wages. You see God's blessings? She didn't make any money on her own son before this. And now comes the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And if that weren't enough, I'll pay you. Nurse your own baby boy. Oh, gladly. <laughs> what a beautiful baby. I'm going to make money, Lord, off of my own child. Isn't God good? God was watching the whole way. Then, of course, we know Moses grows up and Moses takes matters into his own hands when he when he sees an Egyptian smiting one of the Hebrews, what's he do? Moses' way of thinking God's going to deliver is, I'll just kill the guy. So he takes the Egyptian and he kills him, and, and then he tries to cover it up by burying him in the sand. And the following day, he sees two of the Hebrews striving together, and he says, hey, what are you doing? Your brethren, don't fight between yourselves. And the one stops and says, aha, you. Intendest thou to kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? What, are you going to kill me like you did to him yesterday? Oh, it's leaked out. We know what you did. Moses, oh, no. Surely this thing is known. And he fled from the face of Pharaoh. But he didn't flee from the face of God, did he? God knew what he did. And God let him wander out there for 40 years until he was 80 years old. And all of a sudden, Moses went up into the mountain and he saw a peculiar sight. What do you see? What do you see? What is that thing? Why, that's peculiar. A bush that was on fire. But the more he watched, the more it burned and it was not consumed. And he says, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. And he walked up to it. And when he did, what did he hear? Moses. <laughs> I don't know if I speak the voice of God very well, but Moses. Take off your shoes. I'm not going to take them off. I'm just going to act like I'm going to take them. I'll save you that. Amen, amen. You're too close. 
take off your shoes. Moses takes his shoes off. For the place we're on now stand is his holy ground. Moses was afraid. And the Lord said, certainly, Moses, I've seen the affliction of the children of Israel. I have heard their cry by reason of their affliction. Bondage, hard and cruel bondage. The devil, the world, Pharaoh, Egypt, all that that was about, the Lord was about to deliver these people that were under bondage. Over 400 years, finally the deliverer was here and God said to Moses, come now therefore and I will send thee unto Pharaoh that thou mayest deliver the children of Israel, deliver my people. And Moses says, sure, I'm ready to go. Let's go, Lord. And Moses says, what? <laughs> well, uh, 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 Lord, uh, uh, me? Yeah, you. You. I'll send you. I'm not eloquent. I can't speak. Lord, you know I can't speak. I can't do it. Didn't he make all kinds of excuses? And the Lord says, certainly. And this is one of my life verses. Certainly. I feel in the sense of eloquence that I'm like Moses. And I don't know, I've said this before. But many of you may not know. Many of you do. When I was a kid, I was in speech class. I had a hard time. I had a hard time. I had a hard time communicating. My mother said, if she was here, she would, she would say I was 100% right because she told me this. And I didn't know it, but she says, you didn't speak until you were almost four years old. Barely spoke. Now they can't shut me up, right? <laughs> but true, I barely spoke. There was a reason why I didn't speak. I had a problem. It's a, in kindergarten class, it was a shame to some. i call you out of the class. You, you, you. Leave. Why do we leave? And back then, they weren't real, you know, they singled you out. Nowadays, you know, you know how it is nowadays. Then it was, you're a dunce. That's the way it was. You're stupid. Go to speech class. And everybody, <laughs> He, why, where's he going? He can't talk. Then you come back in the class. You sit down, you know, everybody look at you. Hey, stupid. Dummy. Couldn't say your words. Couldn't speak. Oh, I get what Moses is saying. I totally understand. When I read it, I just chuckled myself and say, Lord, what you can do with, with those that don't have the gifts how you can impart things to people who are needy and what you can do with your, with your creation. Moses was true in what he was saying. He was not eloquent. He could not speak. He didn't have the confidence to do this. I can't do it, Lord. You know I can't. I can't go down there again. I can't do it. I, I won't do it. I'm not eloquent. You know my brother Aaron, he can speak. He's better at this than call him, not me. And finally Moses wins out, and God says to Aaron, and Moses said, go down together. And you know the irony of it all? When they get down there, who does all the talking? Moses. You didn't need him at all. All you needed was God, didn't you? I love the verse. Certainly I will be with thee. This is what God says to him. Certainly I will be with thee. And I know it in my own life. Certainly, Kevin, I will be with thee. And if God calls you, certainly, whoever he calls, I will be with thee. And God will be with you. And God will do marvelous things through you if you just yield yourself over to him. I can guarantee you, when Moses got on the other side of the Red Sea, and he saw all those dead Egyptians lie there on the, on the seashore. When he saw all of it happen, and he looked back and saw the sea come back from its power, 
and its destruction of the, of the uh, 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 Pharaoh there and the Egyptians as he killed them all. And when he stood there and looked back, it was at that moment that Moses probably looked up to heaven and he says, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And would he have ever traded what he went through for the world? No, no. But at the beginning, it wasn't. He chose to suffer with the people of God rather than to enjoy, the Bible says, to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. You see, the pleasures of sin, they don't last long. Oh, there may be pleasure in the devil's playground. There may be some pleasure there for a while, but in the end, sin comes back. The chickens come home to roost and sin takes its effects. And I'll tell you what, when a person is bound in sin and the bondage of this world, there's no peace, no comfort, no joy. It may only last for a little while. But I'll tell you what, no matter what happens to a Christian, you've got the peace of God and it passeth all. Come on. It passeth. The reason I know you know this is because you live it. The peace of God passeth all understanding. Can't understand. How can you have peace through this? How can you go through this and have peace? Because you have God. The peace of God that passeth all understanding shall, here it is, beautiful, shall comfort your hearts and minds. Comfort. We can take comfort in tribulation. We can take comfort in affliction. We can take comfort in trials because we have God. They came out and the Lord brought them out. And when he brought them out, he said, remember, remember what I did for you. And remember how I brought you out. I brought you out of the iron furnace. I brought you out from cruel and hard bondage. I brought you out from the hand of Pharaoh, just like from the hand of Satan. I brought you out from this world, and I made you a peculiar people unto myself. Isn't that what God has done for us? Christ gives freedom. He gives liberty from bondage. Let's go over and look at uh, Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. I'm going to get a couple passages here. We're going to look at Jesus gives us freedom from bondage. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 and verse number four. Isaiah 53, let's go to verse number three. We're talking about a prophecy towards Christ. And we know this to be Christ because Christ was despised and he was rejected. And he's still despised and he's still rejected. I don't understand how a person can hate Jesus Christ. I don't understand that. I mean, I, I, I don't get it. Maybe it's because I'm saved and I know Jesus and I understand what he did for me. And I'm forever grateful to him. I just can't understand how somebody could hate Christ. I can't understand it. How could somebody hate and even if you don't believe who he was, if he really was God in the flesh, which the Bible says he is, though the world and they in the world don't always accept that. But that said, how could you hate a man? If he was a man to the world, to me, he's God. And I want to make that perfectly clear. And to you, he's God. Amen. But to the world, say, we believe him to be a man. I met a man yesterday who said, he was only a man. Okay, how could anyone hate him even if he was only a man? How could they? What did he do? What did he do? He gave his life for everybody. He died for the sins of the whole world. How could anybody hate anyone with that intention? And according to the Bible, he was God in the flesh. So therefore, being God in the flesh, knowing sinful man, how could anybody hate the attempt of God to die for them? 
How could you say, I hate that person? I have talked to people over the course of my life. I met a Muslim once. And as I talked to him about Jesus Christ, he gave me all these explicatives, and he put them right before the name of Jesus. And he included the F word in there with directing it towards Jesus Christ. And I said to myself, how foul can somebody be to put those words before the man who died for them? You say, well, they're ignorant. They don't know. They know that he died. And they know why he died. They may not accept him as God, but how dare them put words like that before a person who died for them? It would be like somebody jumping on a grenade to save your life. And then you do that to a person. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. He laid down his life to bear our sin and to free us from cruel, hard bondage. And whether you want to accept that or agree with that or not, he paid the price for every man, woman, and child that ever lived. Amen. Because surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He bore them, our griefs, and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Verse 4, surely he hath borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes, look, we are healed I think suffice to say he died for us he bore our sins he bore our iniquities by his stripes we're healed oh thank God for the blood of Christ without the blood of Christ we have no forgiveness without the blood of Christ we have no redemption Without the blood of Christ, we're still in hard, cruel bondage under the devil. But he came to free us. He came to free us. And the scripture says, if the Son, therefore, will make you free, you shall be free indeed. You say, where is that, Pastor? I want to get that. Let's go to John 8. John 8. John 8 and Hebrews 2. These will be our last verses. John 8 and Hebrews 2. John chapter 8 and Hebrews 2. I'll wait for you to get there. John chapter 8 and Hebrews 2. John chapter 8 and Hebrews 2. Let's go to Hebrews 2 first. Hebrews chapter 2. We were saved with such a great deliverance. As the children of Israel were brought across that Red Sea by God's hand, we we're saved by God's hand. As he delivered them, he delivered us. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he, this is Jesus Christ, also himself likewise took part of the same. That means he took flesh and blood that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them. Look at this. You could put your name right there. I could put Kevin Dragonak right there. I could put Tony 
in there. I can put Kurt in there. I can put Nicole in there. I can put Ben in there. And I can put Abigail in there. I can put everybody in there that's here today and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to what? Bondage. The devil's got people bound. The devil has people bound. And there's only one way to get out of the bondage. And here's how you do it. Bound. Bound with a chain that no person can break. Bound with a chain that only one has the key. Bound with a chain. Bound by sin. Not even a fault of your own. You see, we're sinners not because of our fault. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Only one who ever lived since then that never sinned, and that was Christ Jesus. And they killed him and put him on a cross. He died to break the bondage of sin. And that bondage of sin holds us until we come to Jesus and we say to him, Lord, I want to be free. I want to be free. I'm tired of being bound to this sin. You have the key. Free me, Lord. We repent of our sin and Christ truly forgives us. And what's he do? He breaks the chains. In John 8, it says, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I once was lost. I once was blind. I once was bound. The Son made me free. And He can make you free today. He can come and quicken and he can save you and he can deliver you from the bondage of the devil and from the bondage of this world and from the bondage of sin. Only Christ can do that. So what do you have to do? Forget your way. You have to come to Christ with childlike faith. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. All you got to do is ask. I'm going to give you a moment here, an opportunity for those listening on Zoom and on the phone, an opportunity if you're listening today and you're not saved. Today is your day of salvation. You can come to Jesus and get delivered from the bondage of sin. And all you have to do with your head bowed and your eyes closed, nobody looking around. You can do business with God right now. From the bottom of your heart, He can save you. He can forgive you. Why don't you ask Him right now to come into your heart and to be your personal Savior. Please pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I come to you now. Lord, I'm bound in sin. I need to be free. I'm sorry for my sins. Lord, I repent of them. I pray that you'd be merciful to me, a sinner. Please come into my heart, Lord Jesus, right now. Come into my heart and be my personal Lord and my personal Savior. And give me this gift of eternal life and save my soul from hell. Thank you, Lord, for being merciful to me. And thank you for saving me, dear Jesus. In your precious name I pray. Amen. If you meant it, today is your day of salvation and you've been freed from the bondage of corruption, the bondage of sin, the bondage of the devil, the bondage of the world. Today, you've been free. And if you're already saved, praise the Lord, you are free. Amen.